Welcome to Alumni Connections. I'm so excited to bring to you today Dr. Alicia Taylor. We're going to get into her story. Uh, we're going to hear all about it. I'm going to play my little theme song here for the Alumni Connections. Uh, if you're joining us, I really appreciate you. Hang on. Uh, if you're coming to us recorded, you can, of course, fast forward. Let me see if I can share this so we can actually hear it. This is the Alumni Connections Project. We all know Randolph is better than the rest. Even when you progress, you still got a rep. A Philip Randolph Campus High School. But this is not a test. You should stay in with your chest. Be proud of your origin. And if you are proud, support it then. Stronger together through unity. Better together. Let's build the community. Randolph isn't a school or a building. It's a legacy. It's not in your past. It's your identity. So show some pride. Alumni Connections is sponsored and brought to you by SBI, CCPI. SoundFoundSoundBusiness.org SoundFoundSoundBusiness.org The journey doesn't end with graduation and prom The journey doesn't end with graduation and prom The journey doesn't end with the journey doesn't end This is the Alumni Connections Project This is the Alumni Connections Project 8 Philip Randolph Randolph 8, eight Philip Randolph 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 So Dr. Alicia Taylor, uh, she's a 1992 alumni from Randolph, uh, 1996 graduated from Spelman, uh, New School for Social Research, graduate faculty of political and social science, alumni class in 1999. Uh, I'm assuming that's a master's, you can chime in, Alicia. And then uh, Columbia University Teachers College class of 2006. Alicia was born and raised in the Bronx, New York. She's a graduate of A. Philip Randolph Campus High School, class of 92, and was among SBI's first cohort. Prior to entering the field of philanthropy, Oh, my goodness. Philanthropy. Alicia was a lecturer in international educational development at Columbia University's Teacher College, where she also completed her doctoral studies. She also holds degrees in psychology from Spelman College and the Graduate Faculty for Political and Social Sciences of the New School for Social Research. She's on the board of directors for the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. Dr. Alicia Taylor is the principal of Herald Advisors, a consulting firm that operates globally to provide strategic guidance to governments and international organizations on systems and policy reform, organizational design, and effective partnerships. Until October 2016, she was the deputy director of the Open Society Education Support Program, where she managed a team across five countries to implement a global grant making program that sought to strengthen education systems and civil society. Alicia is a specialist in systems building, particularly in conflict affected states. She is currently serving as the interim chief technical officer for insights for education, responsible for securing international partnerships and the design of a collaboration with the Ministry of Education in Kenya to improve capacity for evidence based policy making. Amazing. Thank you Thank for being here with me, Alicia. Thank you for having me. So I want you to talk to us because you have just an amazing resume. You've accomplished amazing things. Uh, I want you to talk to us about what you're currently doing, which is very exciting. Reading it gets me pumped. Um, I want you to talk to me about what you're currently doing, and then we will not say too much um about how you got there and all that but just tell me what's kind of going on now what you're doing now and then we will kind of go back through the randolph story okay cool so right now i am a um an independent consultant or head of my own consulting firm so i'm the principal of herald advisors which is my firm that i started um when i transitioned from the open society foundations um, and so I'm going on, wow, in two weeks, it'll be four years. Um, and that's quite, quite amazing, frankly, to me, because <laughs> I'm, Absolutely. you know, grateful and sometimes shocked, actually, um, that I'm doing as, as well as I am, particularly in a, in a pandemic. Um, and so, as you mentioned, we provide or I provide strategic advisory services to international development organizations. Um, and agencies within, um, largely within the education sector. And so for, for example, two of my clients um, now, one is called Insights for Education, which is a new foundation. And so I'm working with, as an interim chief technical officer, um, 
uh, and supporting the CEO to establish uh, partnerships with UN agencies and, and some global funders and to design a program, um, a partnership program and strategic uh, capacity building program with um, the Ministry of Education in Kenya. And we can talk a bit more about that. Uh, as well, and how I got into international education. I think we'll circle back through that. Another one of my clients is the Africa Grantmakers Affinity Group. And so I'm working with the executive director um, of that net. It's essentially a network of philanthropies that um, do grant making in across Africa, across sectors. So this is not specific to the education sector and working with them on some strategic planning and doing a scenario planning process with them because they are um, 20 years old and transitioning into the trying to figure out the next phase of um, their program. So I'm working with them to figure out how they want to position themselves within the field and fundraising and governance and infrastructure and, and all of that. When I hear you talk, I mean, I'm just like, I'm just blown away because mm -hmm. you're doing such incredible things. Um, I mean, I, I definitely feel you, you know, we were talking about uh, just before you jumped on, you know, making the move from being in, in big corporate, having your own company for the last four years and and the transition of that, uh, being an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Uh, an entrepreneur in a pandemic. <laughs> Let me tell you. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into all those pieces of the story, but let's, let's rewind it and we'll go back uh, to okay. early days. So where yeah. were you in junior high and, uh, and how did a Randolph get on your radar? Wow, junior high school, I was at um, Our Savior Lutheran School in the Bronx. I grew up in the Bronx near Gun Hill and White Plains Road. Um, and I went to Our Savior Lutheran from second grade through eighth grade. When I transitioned um, to high school, I actually wanted to go to <laughs> Cardinal Spellman, because I knew I wanted to go to Spellman College, and I thought it would be really cute to go to Spellman High School and Spellman College, because I kind of plan my life in sometimes random ways, because it rhymes. Um, <laughs> uh, literally, actually. And, and also, a lot of my friends were going to Spellman. I ended up at campus um, because, really, my mother kind of forced me to go there. God rest her soul. Um, and her point at the time, I remember she said she felt like I was too much of a follower. Um, she didn't like the fact that I was following my friends um, to Spelman High School. Um, I had also been in a very sort of um, not closed environment, but, you know, had some strong boundaries um, in terms of like, you know, who I went to school with and the people that lived in my building, we all rode the bus together. And so I was always in a sense sheltered. I didn't really take the train by myself. And my mother was attracted to A. Philip Randolph because of the connection to City College and the idea that I could graduate from high school um, with not only being exposed to a college environment, but um, also potentially have college credits, which I did. So when I went to Spelman, I think I had um, at least not, I think I had nine credits when I went to, when I went to Spelman. Wow. Um, uh, so that's what, 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 um, sort of drove me there. The connection to city college. Um, I think the distance from my home and the fact that I would have to sort of open myself up to, um, you know, just new groups and, and I would be exposed. So my mother was very big on, um, you need to be exposed to more, you need to like, you know, go into an environment and figure it out. So coming from a school where I think our savior was a K through 12 school and probably had, there might've been like three, 400 people in the school total. So you had the option to continue there? I had the option to continue there, but I knew I didn't, I didn't want to. Right. Um, so it's not actually something that I, I considered. I knew I would go to, um, really, I thought I would go to a, a, a Catholic school. Yeah, uh -huh. I meant to say go mom earlier because I said, you know, that she was definitely uh, saying some good stuff and getting that exposure. Yeah, I mean, she was, I mean, I was a little pissed at the time, but I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, even, I even went so far as to register at Spelman. And finally, she was just like, I, I just can't, I can't, I can't allow you to do that. And so she literally forced me to go to um, A. Philip Randolph specifically because of the exposure. 
you know, it's, it's something to be said for parents pissing us off. Like there's, there's a, you know, it's, it's something that, um, if they're not, if you're, if you're not pissing off your kids at some point, you're probably doing something wrong, right? You know, you know absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so talk to me about what, what walking into Randolph uh, for the first time was like and, and what those first couple of years were like. Wow. It was overwhelming, I think, for me. Um, so my junior high school, again, had I've been with the same people, the same cohort, really, since the second grade. Um, the whole school, including the high school, had probably maybe 400 um, students in K through 12. Um, and so walking into campus where I think my freshman class probably had 400 students. Um, and there were all those steps. And <laughs> so just like navigating the building was a lot. Um, taking the train every day from, and, and you know, the other thing, I grew up one block from Evander Childs High School um, on Gun Hill Road. And so just the idea, like I would have to leave home, I think it was in the wintertime, it would still be dark. You know, my brother would still be in the bed covered up because he could just like roll out of bed at 15, 15 minutes before class started somehow or 20 minutes and then still make it to school on time um, with his three minute commute as opposed to my hour and 15 or 20 minute commute. So it took me a while to get used to that. Frankly, I was kind of pissed. Uh, um, but it was, I did then find it really interesting in terms of the, just the variety of people that I met. I never, like, I didn't know people who lived in Brooklyn before I went to campus. I didn't really know people who grew up in Queens, you know? My church is in Harlem on, actually right down the street from campus on 145th and Convent. So I was familiar with the, that, you know, the okay. area and people in the area. So that, that there was some level of familiarity. Well, at least, at least but, you have that going for you because I know just yeah. wanting to say, because of course there are Brooklyn students that are attending yeah. and, and, and Deep Bronx like yourself that were attending. Deep Bronx. Was also... Heights kids that were like literally with that, yeah. thing, you, know, I, you know, and when I do these interviews and it's definitely yeah. a thing when, when you're in school and you're counseling a kid on like, all right, what, what time do you go to sleep? Cause you got to get up at five o'clock in the morning and come to school. And, and that becomes okay. a part of the counseling piece. But um, it's interesting how the stories differ for folks that yeah. <laughs> grew up in the Heights and then grew up in the boroughs. Yeah. Right. 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 So that was, I mean, it was, it was significant for me. And then just the exposure to different types of people as well. Like I remember just freshman year, like, you know, understanding that before then I didn't understand the distinctions between um, uh, Latinx and well, Latino communities at, at the time and Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and the, 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 um, complexities of, of the group interaction and the overlaps, because I kind of put everybody in one um, bucket because where I grew up by White Plains Road, you know, it was like you either black or Jamaican. I mean, yeah. African-American or Jamaican, you know? And so it was, it helped me to, you know, understand the diversity in my community um, around me and have exposure to different types of friends and people from different different places and different perspectives and walks in life. And we have, remember we had people in our, class um who you know Sarafina was a big play at the at the at the time and so there was like the daughter I think of the director I can't remember her name but and you know people whose parents own restaurants and people whose parents didn't work and people whose parents were teachers and so the the variety was very um important for me yeah that's that's awesome do you remember any of the the teachers from that time I definitely want to get into because I think one of the, the fantastic things about your story, and this is going back to the days of, of Lottie Taylor, I think there was more, yeah. more um, uh, push around yeah. like being able to get college courses. I mean, the, yeah. you, know, you know, Randolph was put on to the college, city college campus for that mix and um, for that synergy that, that could be created there. It's, it's going back and forth between being more or less uh, of a, a partnership in, in, in the last, I know, 24 years that I've uh, been in and out of the building. Uh, mm -hmm. so I'm definitely interested in your perspective on how that worked out, uh, but definitely love a callback to like any great teachers that you had, things that you really got out from your education. Um, Lottie Taylor is definitely um, a fixture in my mind just because of um, 
you know, her sternness, her staunch advocacy, um, her demand of excellence um, and achievement. I um, recall the thing that always stands out also from my freshman year was the, the, the um, photos and posters of classes that preceded um, mine and the percentage that were enrolled in college. So you saw that as soon as you um, hit the door and understood what the expectations were. Um, of course, Mr. Thompson stands out in my mind uh, quite a bit. Um, and, uh, there was a Dr. Johnson who I think she was like the vice principal. So I don't know if she was a, a, a teacher, but it was, and Miss Ketley. So it's interesting. Actually, I remember that is actually interesting. The people who stand out in my mind are not actually subject teachers. It's the Miss Ketley, who was the, the guidance counselor, Dr. Johnson, who was a vice principal or something. And so she had some sort, she was an administrator, Miss uh, uh, Lottie Taylor, uh, Principal Taylor. Um, and of course, uh, Mr. Mr. Thompson. That's, I think that is interesting because I think, mm -hmm. you know, you get a little bit of a different picture from, from different years and different classes. So it's mm -hmm. just interesting your take on it. Talk to us about uh, junior and, and senior year, what was going through your mind in terms of, mm -hmm. of um, you know, you're getting to that point where, you know, college process is coming in and you're trying to mm -hmm. figure it out. I'm sure mom is, is uh, talking to you. Uh, I'd love to hear all about that. Yeah. So um, junior year. So as I mentioned, like, even when I came into high school, I knew I wanted to go to Spelman College. Um, Which is I incredible, to, by the way, just to know from that early age where you yeah, want to go. I was really clear for a couple of reasons. First of all, speaking of my mother, in my household, there was a requirement, actually, it was a rule. I had to go to a historically Black college or university. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel as though I had an option. Um... And the idea of going away to school was always, you know, was I didn't have a problem like, you know, should I stay in the city? Should I go upstate where I was like, it's kind of cold. Um, or I could go to an HBCU like a lot of them were in the South. So generally and plus it was just my both of my parents attended historically black college, um, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. And from a child, my mother was just like, you know, that's just what you do. Um, you go to a. Actually, I, I guess I followed her instructions because she was like, you go to an HBCU for undergrad and then go to an Ivy League school for um, for graduate school. Even though she wanted me to be a lawyer and that just that just was not working. Or it wasn't going to happen. Um, and so junior year, I was very focused on um, my college applications, SAT, how many credits will I have? Um, do I need to, you know, thinking about my essays? Um and, you know, so volunteering and my extracurricular activities and all of that, I was very much um, focused on. I remember very much, um, you know, Mr. Thompson and some of the college um, counselors that he had volunteering or working with um, SBI, um, reviewing my uh, essays and giving feedback and versions. And then I applied to Spelman under early decision. And so I, 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 so by the time most people were applying to college, I already had my um, acceptance, and I wanted to do that because I knew it was my first and only choice, <laughs> and that I don't know what would have happened. I, I think I don't know if I would. I mean, I would have made it, but like I'd have had a breakdown in all types of situations if I didn't get accepted. When you and, were driven, you were driven, and you had gotten driven. the grades, and you were supporting. Mm -hmm. By your mother and father. Yeah. I mean, you were you were on I was track. focused. I was yeah. focused. And by God's grace, truly, I was accepted by early decision. And then I um when I think you know most of my classmates were applying to college, I was then applying to for um fellowships and scholarships for Spelman. And thankfully, I was awarded a presidential scholarship. So I had a full scholarship, a full academic scholarship for four years to Spelman. And did you had you talked to the admissions office? Had you gone and uh, seen the campus and all that before you applied? Before I applied, that's interesting. Before I applied, no, no. I think I did like you know prospective students weekend or something like that. But I don't, I don't think I visited the college. Why I wanted to go to 
um, Spelman, though. So I had to go to an HBCU. And then, you know, Spelman's always rated as number one, naturally. <laughs> Not <laughs> Clearly. So I, so that kind of made it stand out, number one. Then I like the idea of it being in Atlanta. It was far away. And the other colleges that were like in Maryland and in, in Virginia, where I have family, I was like people about to be popping up. I didn't want to have any of that. Um, and then the thing actually that made me that solidified Spelman in my mind in the eighth grade was that I had a neighbor who grew up right across the hall from me. And she went to Spelman. Um, and I remember when she, this is so clear in my head. I remember the day that she, um, moved out and was like heading to college. And it was something about the way people talked about her. It was like, she's going to Spelman. Like mm. she's going to Spelman and said it in the same way that people said she's going to Harvard. Ooh, she's going to Yale. She's going to, you know? And so I was just like, when somebody, and I kept seeing that, like, Ooh, she's going to Spelman. We so proud of her. I was like, Oh, okay. That's where I'm going. Cause I need that sort of. You know, you know, and what I hear when you say that is it makes a difference when you're growing up what people around you respect, right? Yes. And so yes. you were hearing that that was a respected thing. Now, you know, that's not the case for everybody. And I yeah. think that's something that, you know, it's, it's a huge deal um, and it's, it's impactful that you have yeah. folks around you calling that out and respecting that. I, I, I think that's great. All right. So talk yeah. to us about, so you, you apply, you got in, obviously talk to us about the transition from Randolph Bronx to, to Atlanta and Spelman. BX all day. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. So in the similar way to where Randolph or campus, as we referred to it as the, at the time, um, sort of exposed me to more groups of my people and my community um, in New York, going to Spelman um, exposed me to my community from around the country. So, you know, it was just interesting, different accents. And, you know, why do people from the Midwest have Southern accents? I just remember, like, you're from Ohio. You sound like you're from Alabama. How does that work? Learning about the Great Migration and, and all of that. So I think that, again, exposure comes up. Um, and then I just, I felt very much at home um, there because of my scholarship also. Um, it sort of exposed me to, to, I was able to have interactions with different faculty and with the president. And so that, that there was a lot of, ex, again, exposure um, there. When I started at Spelman, I was, it's funny. So I always, I was always a psychology major, but I started out as a psychology major, a double major in psychology and music because I played the piano. And I went to Harlem School of the Arts after school when I was at um, campus. Oh, that's so great. Then, yeah. And so then, but then my second semester, I was a psychology major and a music minor. By my sophomore year, I was a psychology major because I was like this little one credit for my piano lessons, my piano class that I have to practice every day. It wasn't working in the springtime and it's pulling down my grade point average. What am I doing? So let me just drop this all together. Um, and so it was interesting because I was in the Glee Club and doing concerts and stuff uh, my freshman year, which was, um, it was an experience. Yeah. One year was enough though, yeah. one year was fine. Mm -hmm. The strength placed on the arts is, is not the same, obviously, right? Yeah, no. Um, I'm so interested in just asking this question around culture shock because, you know, so many mm -hmm. students that go to um, majority white schools, right? You know, they, yeah. they always talk about this culture shock. You're yeah. talking about the diaspora at Randolph, which I think is great. You know, we, in our, yeah. in our dance groups, we have this incredible diaspora between, you know, you got um, United Brothers and United and uh, Sisters Only, which is one type of, of dance form that is kind of your traditional African American. We got um, West Indian uh, going all the way over to Desi, which isn't even necessarily what you would call black, but obviously dark skinned mm -hmm. folks and that sort of thing. So you have that diaspora, you have the Latinx and all there. Was there a culture shock for you going to a historically black college? Was there something there that? Um, made you feel out of place or did you just come and you felt ho at home? I felt at home. I felt at home. Um, I don't remember culture shock in that sense. 
um, you know, it was more like getting used to the yeah. accents and, and, and all of that, you know, which I wouldn't necessarily say is a culture shock. But the culture shock, I probably, I remember when I started at the new school, being very clear that had I entered that type of a context at 17, because I'm a year ahead of myself in, in school, so I went to college at 17, I, that I, I wondered, and still sometimes wonder, would I, you know, how different would I be? Oh, I, I guarantee I you, as, as somebody that attended Eugene Lane College at New School, I remember being in the classes and having, you know, time after time, you know, especially black females, you know, that, that had a power to them having to put the teacher in check, uh, students in check, including myself, um, you know, in, in those classrooms yeah. and the stress that goes along with that. Yeah. I, I mean, dealing with that at 21, when I went, it was a lot, actually. And I was, um, I didn't do well my first year and I actually left and went back because I, in my junior year at Spelman, I did a year of study abroad in Kenya, which is how I got into international development or where that kind of started. And so I left in between my um, first year and I went back to Nairobi because I was like, these people, I don't know, <laughs> I can't do this. Mm. Um, and then I came back after a year and and just finished my, my degree because at that point it was like, let me just finish my master's and get up out of here because this ain't going to work. Mm. And I, I was clear, I was like, psychology is not for me because I'm not about to be sitting here talking in circles with people, which yes. is what I thought at the time. Right. Yeah. No, it's 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 very frustrating. I remember so clearly the conversations going down in those classrooms. And unfortunately, those are the same conversations that continue in the public spaces and the political spectrum. And yes. I, think, I think a circle is a very good, uh, a, yes. a, a nice way to put it, put it right. Yes. Uh, in terms well, of that, that, and also let's call, call out. I mean, they, they were outright racist. So, for example, People would say to me like, oh, you went to Spelman, so how are you finding your classes? And I was confused because I was like, what are you talking about? How are you keeping up? How, like they thought I was behind. And I thought it was absurd because I was like, neither one of these professors could actually maintain a, an academic career at Spelman. Let's start there. And then there was this whole like, what I guess I would call fake woke thing. I'm like, first of all, most of y'all are trust fund babies and you up here like trying to be an activist on a hunger strike. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. I, I just, I was just confused. It's a, and then I mean, you think you like the NYC white person phenomenon. Uh, I think you get a lot of the idea that they, yeah, yeah. And I, because I know I lived that experience, you know. And in some ways, being a white male in in today's today's society, there's not a lot of ways to get away from the miseducation, you know, of, of mm -hmm. Cameron South or, you know, any, any person mm -hmm. in society, but, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that somebody feels like they understand, you know, a particular experience to the point where they can speak on the behalf of another is, is quite um, overwhelming, I would imagine, uh, especially yeah. when you're faced with it over and over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to me about this, because I, I really don't want to skip over this. Um, you went and you studied abroad in Kenya. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know your background. Do you have any connection to? to no. OK. So you just kind of explored, went out, approached it. Tell us about that experience, studying abroad. I mean, you know, I have to, the way that it came up is very, you know, it's another one of those interesting um, things. I had not, so remember Spellman was like my end all to be all. So the idea that I would leave for a year was very, was not really something I had thought about. And it was very shocking to my family. Um, and they thought I was joking. They didn't believe me at first. Like I'm gonna go to Nairobi for, for nine months. <laughs> my mother was like, what? Um, but I had, it was a friend of mine, one of my close friends who lived um, on my in my dorm my sophomore year. And so I was 18 and, you know, I don't know, I was 18 year old angst, depressed, something, I don't know. Um, and so we were going to the cafeteria and she was just like, come with me to the study abroad office because she wanted to go and study in Australia, which to me sounded really strange. Like, why are you going to leave Spelman and go to Australia? And people were going like, there were a lot of people that went to the UK, which just, just did not make sense to me. So I'm in the office with her. She's learning about the program. Then the woman said, excuse me, um, you know, are you interested in anything? And I was like, no, 
Like, do you have anything? <laughs> I said something. Is there a program in Hawaii or is there someplace cute I can go? Or, you know, is there a program? What program? And I asked her, what programs do you have in Africa? And she said, well, there's a program in Ghana and a program in Kenya. And this is how green I was or how, like, you know, spontaneous in a way it was. I literally, she had a world map and I was like, okay, Ghana, Kenya, where is that? Literally. So it's like Ghana, West Coast. And she pointed to Kenya. I was like, ooh, that's real far. Like if I'm going to go, if I'm leaving Spelman, like I'm going to, I'm going to have to go somewhere that's really out there. Right. And so I said, okay. And then I said, um, well, what languages do they speak? And she said, in Ghana, they speak Twi, which at the moment, I, I at that time, I never heard of the Twi language, a Twi mm-hmm. as a language. And she said, in um, Kenya, the national language is Swahili. And I swear, when she said Swahili, I was like, ooh, that's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Kenya and learn Swahili. And actually, it was literally that tagline that I, um, that I hung on to. So I went, um, through a program at Kalamazoo College for my full junior year. Um, and it was an amazing experience. And honestly, I thought it was, you know, I came back at the end of my junior year thinking I just had the time of my life. I was somewhere, I mean, when I say God takes care of fools and babies, that is one of them. Like, I was like, I have gone and had a year with all, you know, (laughs) there are no reports coming back to my mama or to the deacons at my church. And I could explore myself and and the world and break rules and laws as as freely as possible. Um, Hopefully hopefully this is a good representation of of, uh, Nairobi. Nairobi, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I feel like any, anytime somebody shows a picture of Africa, it's like yeah, you, know, you never see that on, on safari That's or something right. like that. So That's right. show some of the the nice cityscapes uh, of of the of Africa there. Yes, yes. And so it was an amazing year of, I mean, academic study, of course, but really self exploration. And again, um, self exploration, ex- exploration of the world, um, and exposure to. I mean, that was like exposure on on steroids. We traveled a lot around the country. Traveled to South Africa and Swaziland um, on a little side trip that I created <laughs> for my friends. It was sort of you know against the rules, but um, yeah, it was it was quite amazing. Then I came back, finished my senior year. And then continued on what I thought was my career path to be a psychologist, right? And in and so that first year at the new school, and I'm in the classes like, why am I sitting here talking about Freud? Like I kept thinking about the kid, the children, and organizations that I volunteered with, which we we have to do these voluntary um, volunteers and internships and stuff. So one of the main ones that I worked with was with um, street children and helping to get them back in school and to encourage them to go to school. And I just, I, they, they just kept kind of, they just wouldn't leave my mind or my spirit or my heart. And I kept thinking like, you know, well, I wonder if they ran away from the school or are they, this person still in school and why are children on the street if school is free? And I just had these questions rolling through my mind at the same time as people are, you know, I'm sitting up in new school and people are like, you know, thinking that I'm coming from a deficit, like I can't understand or follow. Mm. And I'm like, why am I talking about Freud and Oedipal, Oedipal complexes? Like, I don't actually care. Um, I care about the kids, right? And I, and but I didn't. So I knew I was interested in education, but I was also clear that I did not want to be a teacher. But I didn't know, like, what else do you do, right? I don't. I didn't want to be a teacher. And I didn't want to be an administrator in a school. Um, so I ended up going back to Nairobi <laughs> as a teacher. Um, because it was a means to an end. Because I, if I volunteered at the school as a teacher, I could I was have gonna, a free apartment. I was just going to say, because I, I don't want to interrupt that thought, but I just want to yeah. say, because it, it sounds to me like you wanted to make an impact beyond the classroom. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Although I probably wouldn't have said it at the time. Like at the time, I knew that education is important. Everybody should get education. I don't understand why children aren't in school. And that was it. Like education transforms lives. Why are children on the street if education is free? I couldn't connect the dots. And it it just bothered me in my spirit. Like it wouldn't, it was a question 
that wouldn't um, leave me. Essentially. Well, you have a big spirit in talking about your story. And one of the things that when I'm talking to somebody that's young and they say, well, they want to be a nurse or they want to be mm -hmm. an engineer, you know, my mm -hmm. thought always goes to, well, somebody needs to run the hospital. Somebody right. needs to, you know, be in charge of the whole whole system. That's right. Why somebody has to order run. the medicine. Right. Some why aren't you going towards the, you know, the the larger goal, especially right. as a young person? That's the best mm -hmm. time to dream big and go after that. And I know you were very driven. So having that idea of, of wanting to do something beyond that, um, mm -hmm. it, that, that resonates with me. So, anyways, um, so you you you've made this this decision. You don't want to be in the classroom. You got this bigger goals. You've seen some of the world and you want to go do something about it. Go ahead. So then I knew, so then it started to boil down to, and then I used to, I came back and I graduated from um, the new school. I got my master's in psychology with the um, emphasis in mental health and substance abuse counseling. <laughs> and my, my thesis was on the long-term cognitive deficits of chronic marijuana use, mm. which was fascinating and more for my own personal exploration, frankly, at the time. Cause I was like, am I about to really be out of my mind when I'm 70 from, you know, all of my explorations, let's just say. <laughs> um, and so, but I knew, and I, I started um, like doing, and I figured like, oh, okay, while I'm figuring things out, um, knowing that I didn't want to do, have a full career in psychology. I was like, I can make a little bit more money. I was interested in drug abuse and, but again, realizing that it was more from a, what I later understood to be a policy perspective, which is the same sort of understanding I came to in education. So when I, what I understood, no, let me go back. So when I graduated, I, um, taught for a little bit because again, it was a means for, to an end. Um, and then I joined the, um, the I worked for NYCHA, the New York City Housing uh, Authority in their community development, community operations um, department and supported and evaluated um, after school programs in, um, in, in community and developments. And so, you know, at the time I'm making a decent salary and people are like, oh, you know, you're 25, you have a master's and when you're 50, you can retire and then you can go and do what you want to do. And I was just like, I know y'all don't think I'm about to be sitting here for 25 years, bored to death. Right. And then I can go and do what I want to do at 50. Like that just seemed crazy to me again. So I knew I needed to do something else, but I didn't have, I didn't know what it was. But what I knew was I wanted to travel a lot and I needed somebody to pay for it. <laughs> I wanted to be going back and forth to Africa. I want to do something in education, but I didn't, but I don't want to be a teacher. And it got to the point where, you know, again, probably like this young adult angst and people say you have midlife crisis that I don't know, 40, 50, whatever the age is. I'm like, I think that crisis, that thing for me came at like 25. But I think what was critical for me was you have to get comfortable just being pinpointing what it is that you want like what it is what is it that you're clear on even if it doesn't make sense to other people and or it doesn't have to make sense to yourself because half the time i didn't make sense to myself i know it sounds crazy that i have 25 i have a master's degree but i'm still trying to find myself i want to go what do you want to do i want to go back and forth to africa and work in education and people would say oh you want to be a teacher no i don't want to be a teacher so people would just look at me like i was crazy the other thing i knew i was like this whole working year round with two weeks off that is not going to work for me I was clear. <laughs> I was like, that's not just nine to five and I get a week vacation. That's not my life. I don't know what my life is, but I know it's not that. So sometimes I think there's a lot of pressure to say, what is it that you want? And sometimes you got to like um, sort of approach that question from the backside. Like sometimes you're, you're not clear on what you want but you're clear on what you don't want. And sometimes start, you know, and starting there, I think is, is um, critical. So how I got into this field was I just kept repeating, this is what I know. I know I sound crazy, but this is what I know. And somebody said to me, I will never forget, I was standing on the corner of 145th Street and Convent Avenue outside of my church. And um, this woman who had gone to teacher's college, she was just like, so Alicia, what are you doing? And I, you know, went into my spiel. Well, da, da, da. well what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to work in education and I want to travel to Africa and I want to, you know, and I was just like, I know I sound crazy. Um, and she said to me, she was like, because people would always scrunch their face like, okay. Um, 
And she was like, you know, there's a department at Teachers College called International and Transcultural Studies. I, and she had her doctorate from Teachers College in early childhood education. She was like, I'm, I've never been able to understand what it is that they do or what that department or their programs are about, but it kind of sounds like what you're talking about. Like, they, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds similar to these other people where I don't know what they're talking about either. <laughs> Literally. And I went to the website, looked it up, um, and found, so in the Department of International and Transcultural Studies, there was a program called International Educational Development. And in that program, there was a policy analysis um, concentration. And when I read the description, I realized that the questions that had been gnawing at me were policy questions. Mm. And the department and its focus and the courses resonated and answered the questions that I've been walking around with that I just couldn't put any word or sometimes format um, to. So that's how I kind of got into into that. Yeah. You know, I think some people, they, they read books and they find something in a book that, that speaks to them. And, yeah. sometimes, and sometimes the process is a little bit longer, yeah. uh, like in your case. And I love There's that. You, know, you were, you were going through, you were learning the next thing, learning the next thing, knowing a little bit more about what you don't want, <laughs> learning, yeah. learning a little bit more about what you do want. And then yeah. uh, having somebody put the pieces together uh, and, and let me just just um, one thing there. I think this whole like the the freedom of exploration and that the sky is open to me, um, you know, because of the support of my family. And I think also, you know, the 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 training and exposure at campus and SBI that you can be whatever it is that you want to be. You don't have to follow a predefined path of what they expect you um, to do. Yeah, I, I love that. And I love the fact that you were all along putting degrees on the wall, because that's sort of what we're sort of preaching. It's like, you know, college yeah. might not be for everybody, uh, but certainly those pieces of paper open some more doors for you. And right. I love even the fact that, you know, you did the year abroad, uh, and Kenya, and, and now, you know, you're going back and you're utilizing that experience. So the fact that that college experience opened that door, which yes. for so many people that don't travel and don't get exposure to these things, they'll just never know what right. they found uh, because they haven't had that opportunity. That 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 I, I really love about That's the story. Exactly. And I've so, since lived in, I lived in East Africa for four years in Kenya and Tanzania. I've lived in Liberia working and I lived for four years in um, in London. And I've traveled to 63 countries. Wow. All right. So, 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 we gotta get into that. so, so you finish, so you, you go into this program, you, you mm -hmm. know, you're, you finally kind of finding your, your path, your treasure uh, at the end of the rainbow, you found what you, what, what you're looking for. So I'm talk about going. that journey. And cause I want to, I want to hear about, you know, how you started living in these different places and get a little mm -hmm. bit of extra to that story. That's amazing. Okay. So, Kenya, my junior year, then came back, right? Started at the new school, had a, I don't know what you call it. Like it wasn't working. And to add one random bit to the piece, I wanted to go back to Kenya, but I didn't have like, a, it wasn't like a proper program. And I was trying to piece things together and I was scared because my family is like, you need to get all as many degrees as possible. And um, drop. Oh, and I had a, 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 a scholarship, a full scholarship to the new school. So mm. the idea of leaving graduate school, number one, and then leaving a fellowship, it just I mean, I can't even explain the <laughs> the dramatics of um, that conversation right. um, with my, my mother, especially. Um, but then I heard. A um, song called. Uh, so it's just like, you know, when I had in the, the study abroad person's office. And it was like, Kenya, Swahili. I was like, yes, that's it. And I was clear. Buju Bantan, Till Shiloh. Um, he has a song called Till I'm Laid to Rest. I'll always be depressed. There's no life in the West. I know the East is the best. And he, it's a song about going back to Africa. When I heard that song, I was done. And I was clear that I had to, that I had to, I had to leave. It was like a, a if you, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm very, spiritual and led by spirit. And so there was like a tug that I couldn't explain. 
And you're um, saying spirit, and in my mind, I'm saying gut because I think sometimes people ignore that yeah. that calling, that thing that yeah. says this is what you're meant to do. This is this is it. Um, yeah, they're in their head too much, and sometimes you just got to go with the spirit that's calling. Absolutely. With the spirit, that's, yes. So gut, intuition, the still small voice, the Holy Spirit. For me, I'm just clear. And I think it's very important. You know, you want to, are you going to sign up for what society says you should be? And I'm clear. And my prayer is that I want to be in the center of God's will for my life. Yes. Period. And, and when you say society, you know, what society is meant to me, you know, we are living in a time when, you know, I think it's, you know, we're, I think we're living in the best time period ever. You know, we can talk about political upheaval and everything, but that's not, not mm -hmm. anything new. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've had better leaders, but you know, that's, that's always been true and always been the case and will always probably be the case. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll say this, the idea that um, you said to yourself, I'm going to go out and I'm going to change something. I, I mean, that's powerful to me. That is something that's, you know, I think we all need to be focused on because um, making this check, paying these bills, very important. But it's really important to know that we can do that while making a difference as well. I think that's mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. uh, is huge. While making a difference and while living the life that you want to live. Yes. Yeah. And I, I made a note, I, I dropped in the comments because I thought it was a, a really important part of of your message there, you know, as a life guide, what kind of lifestyle do you want? So in thinking about your career and thinking about your next move, how do you want your life to be is a really big, important piece of your planning, you know, how you want, to yes. live, whether it's travel, whether it's, yes. you know, yes. spending half the year in, in a, in a tropical climate, you know, that, yes. whatever, whatever, whatever that is. Right. Yeah loading because that's coming and i think too again sometimes you you know you can only hold on to very small things i just remember being clear i'm going to travel a lot and i'm not about to be buying plane tickets all over the place so and <laughs> and and so that also you know kind of narrows down your your options and i kind of narrow things down um from there but when i found international educational development that helped me to you know focus on a career and i was thinking i would probably do some un like work for the un or unicef and and things and so um i did the second year in kenya and then i came back and then um when i started at the new school i was at NYCHA for two years and then when i started at the new school in 2001 my dissertation research was on um was based in Tanzania. I knew I wanted to focus on East Africa, but then my my advisor um, focused on Tanzania. So I ended up focusing on um, Tanzania. So I lived in Tanzania for two years doing my dissertation research. And then I stayed there to, rather than coming back to New York to sit in the teacher's college library to write my dissertation, I was like, I can just stay here in this cute house with some fresh food. Um, and 30 minutes from Zanzibar and write my dissertation, which is which is what I did. Probably a better cost so that was of too. <laughs> Probably uh, a better cost of living too. Absolutely. <laughs> cost and quality. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I did that. Um, so that's so that's where the four years in East Africa came from. When I graduated in 2006, I'd stayed in, I didn't really have a plan. And that's the other thing. You know, things don't. Yeah, I, I didn't have a plan. So I came back, literally my dissertation um, defense was Monday. I came back on, I left, I came back on either Friday or Saturday right. um, and defended. And I was like writing up to the last minute. So I was like, I'll figure out what I'm going to do next year. But I just know, I think I'm supposed to leave Tanzania now. And I was clear. I was like, I don't leave Tanzania now. I'm, I'm never leaving. Mm. Um and so I came back and then at the time, my dissertation advisor was about to go on sabbatical and the institution being the way it was, hadn't started recruiting her replacement. So I, that's how I ended up being a lecturer at Teachers College. And I was like, actually, this is perfect because it gives me a year to figure out, do I actually want to go into academia? Because again, that whole, I didn't have to work year round, right? So I'm like, my summer's off, the classes are in the evening because I'm also not a morning person. I was like, this is perfect, but then, <laughs> Um, that whole, I wasn't trying to like research and write and that whole publish or perish thing just wasn't going to work for me, but I did enjoy the interaction with, um, students. And I also use that as a strategic, um, intervention, a strategic, um, space to explore my next step. So 
I was a, you know, a full-time faculty member at Teachers College. So when I would, um, I basically invited guest speakers, like I don't care what the class needed, but if I wasn't interested in a job at your organization, you likely were not about to be invited to be a guest speaker at my class. So I would just invite people from UNICEF and different organizations. Oh, come and like, let's go to coffee. And then people would always say like, oh, so what are you doing? And she's like, actually, I'll be looking for a job. And so then I, that's how I started to, um, you uh, know, listen, folks, if, if you all listening up, this is networking one on one. That's right. Me, that's so. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to have a strategy for everything. Like you'll be talking, you know, and especially when you're in a position of what other people see as power. Right. Like, yeah. how do you use that for your own, not just for your own benefit, but to advance whatever questions you have or issues you have or or um, or yeah, whatever. And let's not mistake. This is this is the strategy that that people in, in all walks of life for using. It's just unfortunate Absolutely. that not everybody, especially if you're talking about poor people's, um, we don't, and I'm speaking as, as, as from my family background and, and, and folks that I know, um, we don't get given these tools that no. uh, say, this is how you, you leverage. This is how you move. How you That's right. That's right. So, um, and then, so from there, I, found one of my um, dissertation advisors used to be on the board of, or used to be engaged with the Open Society Foundation's education program. So she um, sent me the job opening and it was in London. And so I applied for the job because also I realized like the UN agency, and I really actually at that point wanted to work for UNICEF. I knew I didn't want to work for at that point um, an NGO because I was like this whole fundraising thing. I don't I'm not so sure about that. But the idea of working in philanthropy, I was like, oh, I'm giving away somebody else's money. Let's that 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 can work. So I um, explored OSF and I applied for the position and um, I moved to London in May, July, something spring of um, July of 2007. And I started there. And my first project was in my first responsibility. My largest responsibility was in Liberia, because that was the time when Ellen Johnson Sirleaf had just, Liberia had just transitioned out of its 20 year period of um, unrest. Okay. And they had um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was coming back in to um, have been democratically elected. Um, and so they were it was the beginning of their democratic transition and they were rebuilding their state systems. Yeah, you, you are talking above my head in terms of international politics right now, but I'll say this. All right. Um, it's it's awesome to have somebody that has that knowledge. So you're in London, you're, you're working with um, uh, Open Society Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, you are working in, so just so I understand it, uh, what were you doing in conjunction with Liberia? So in Liberia, essentially, they were trying to um, get funding from the UN, let's just say in the World Bank, to restart their education system, right? But it's just like, if you apply for a loan, you gotta have your money, you know, like what's your credit score, what's your, you have to have your records. So imagine that for a country, right? Um, for a loan or a grant or whatever you're applying for, if you're applying for money. So now if you've come out of 20 years of unrest, you haven't had, there hasn't been a census. How many, how many teachers do you have? How many students do you have? Where are people? So their systems weren't set up. So Liberia at the time, because they had just shifted out of um, a brutal civil war with Charles Taylor, and it was all in the news, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, first women president in Africa, the global community said, oh, we're going to support her in any way that we can. But then when it got time, came time for them to actually access capital and financing from the international aid architecture, they couldn't. So then they had, because they, you know, their stuff wasn't in order and the, the, the global system wasn't flexible, as flexible as it is now at that time in 2007. So were you basically doing accounting of their policies and systems nah, in place? Uh, well, and it was more of a support thing. So the Open Society Foundations is um, funded and founded by George Soros, right? He's like stays number 20 something on the Forbes list. And uh, <laughs> um, so he had pledged some funds. He pledged $5 million to help them. And then 
basically we put funds together from the UN, from UNICEF, the government of the Netherlands and Mr. Soros and created um, a pooled fund, which helped them to build schools, um, open their teacher training institutes and buy um, books and distribute books. So my role was, in, and, and then it was also supposed to be a stopgap measure to help them get their essentially documents and business in order so that they could access larger sums of funds. So my role at the time, I ended up being seconded as an advisor to the Minister of Education around help supporting them to get their policy and planning processes in order so that they could access funding from the global community, essentially, and then to restart their, their education system. I'm glad, I'm glad you you uh, fill that out in detail because I was like, it's, it's what it sort of sounds like, but it's it's nice to get down to the gritty of it. Yeah. So, so you're doing that. You're doing that for a number of years where you did that. Was that basically the whole four years in London that you you were doing that piece with Liberia? Yeah, well, Liberia main, remained one of my bigger portfolios, but then um, OSF works in Eastern Europe. So I was working with organizations and networks like in, in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia and the Caucasus. And so I traveled like to Georgia. I didn't know like Georgia, the country, not the yes. state. Like, yes. oh, wow, that worked. Um, so, you know, again, exposure, world. Open. Yeah, I, felt good. I, I was staying on. I was I was with you there, so I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like saying I was like I'm going to Georgia, the country, not the state. Um, you know, somebody's buying plane tickets and supporting networks of, of policy organizations and education advocacy organizations. Um, and so a lot of work in Liberia and a lot of work also in Burma, um, Myanmar now. But before it was. They had their whole transition and on Song Su Chi, like when she had just got out of whatever her house arrest, I forget what they what they call it. But again, helping systems, education systems to restart and become more democratic and open and, and inclusive. Yeah, I remember Burma and the news around her being locked up in her whole house yeah. and all that jazz. Yeah. And then she was assassinated, right? No, nah, she's still alive. She's OK. I, mm -hmm. I seem to remember something about assassination or attempts or something like that. Yeah, definitely some attempts. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so talk to us about the transition because now, did you did you go? You left uh, Open Society to start your own thing. So I came back to. I was in London until um, for four years, and then I trans. And in between those four years, I would um, go and stay in Liberia. Um, for six months at a time, two months at a time, or just go like every four weeks from London um, while I was doing uh, managing other projects and stuff. And then I moved back to New York from the, and worked from the New York office in 2011. Then I left in 2016. And what happened probably by 2014, I just became like, just disengaged. Like there was this, I don't know, an like angst anger, something. And, and what I real what I came to realize, I worked with a coach, which is very um, important. And I think to put a pin there, you mentioned something about like, um, you know, the strategies and tools that other communities use. I think, um, especially for black women, we don't know how to ask for help. And so what I've been exposed to, the, the, the amount of help that people, even in my organization had, the things that I was figuring out by myself, I didn't realize there were resources there. So I got a coach because people, professionals have coaches and you can request them and they help you figure yourself out rather than sitting there going in circles. Um, yeah, not, so, only, not only do folks not know that they have those resources, but it feels like you're doing something wrong if you ask yeah. for it. Meanwhile, yeah. other people are taking advantage of it and it's no big deal. And it is no big deal. Right. And they are going home at night to sleep peacefully while we sitting up until two o'clock in the morning. Um, and so uh, what she helped me to understand was that what I had achieved at OSF was my dream job. I'd achieved my dream. I, that OSF was my dream job. And after five years, I realized that I hadn't sort of visualized or taken the time to plan what is what was next. And um, so I started having these questions. And also, I'm thinking like, this is perfect. Like how much better can it get, right? And then externally, because also when you're in philanthropy and you're the funder in the room, even if the conversation is not relevant, there's a seat for you at the table. And it's very, um, it can be very intoxicating as well if you don't check yourself or if you already have like huge ego issues. Um, and that's why people get into philanthropy and don't leave. 
Um, and so externally, people are like, oh my God, Alicia, your job is so great. And, da, da, da. and then I'm sitting up here like, wait a minute, I'm still struggling to pay my bills. Like, then I started yeah. looking at like how much money people were making. And I was like, wait, this person whose check is twice mine is calling me to pick my brain. Mm -mm. Something's wrong with this. And then I started noticing that um, the way that I was utilized or engaged uh, um, within OSF, I was always on like some special project or Mr. Soros wants like, you know, Burma, who are you going to send to Burma? Send to Alicia. Who are you going to send to Liberia? And when I, in 2007, there was no water, electricity, the roads weren't even paved, but I actually loved it. I think I thrive in chaos. I, I, I just, I get excited. So, if, but if there were, so if there was like a project nobody else understood or nobody wanted to to go to, like when I, the first time I went to Burma, I had to make fake um, business cards saying I was a teacher. I had to take OSF off of my thing because at that time, if you got caught, um, if you if you were known as a grantee of the Open Society Foundations, it was mandatory five years in prison. So I couldn't go to like, hi, I'm the deputy director of the education program. No, I had to be a random teacher. I thought that was very exciting. I still, I still do. But wasn't nobody trying to roll up like with fake business cards to burn? Yeah, uh, that, that sounds frightening. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. <laughs> but again, I mean, it was fantastic to me, right? And so also if there was like a question that the administration had, like I would be leading working groups, like let's explore this or, you know, staff that nobody could, else could work with. All of a sudden they report to me. You know, and so what I realized that I was being used as a consultant within my organization. Mm. I started, um, long story short, just trying to, I, I knew that it was time for me to go. That, and again, holding on to what it is that you know or what it is that you don't know, even if it's not the complete story. I knew it was time for me to go. That's all I knew. There, there, it's been a great ride. I said I was going to, I figured I'd stay when I started. I said I was going to stay five to seven years. I ended up staying nine, almost 10. It was good. Um, no regrets, but I knew that that was not my next step, that I was supposed to take the tools um, that yeah, I learned there. The spirit calling you, the gut instincts. Yeah. And so I went, I was trying to make a shift within the organization. And, you know, they were gaslighting me, to be clear. Um, and so I had a conversation with the president of the foundation and he come to tell me. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know what happened. It didn't work out, but, you know, let's figure this out. And there are all these other things. And I was just like, yeah, nah. And I had prayed the night before and I was like, wow, Lord, like if they tell me that I don't get the job, like what am I supposed to say? Like what? I'm not about to be like, okay. I, I, so I, I just, I was stuck because I knew that I was done. And um, so he said, he was like, actually, no. So then I'm literally in prayer and meditation. Like, what am I going to say? And I, I, it was just clear to me. Mm -hmm. Call it gut, call it Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. I call it the Holy Spirit. It's like, if you, if they tell you no, tell me you're leaving in September. Let me be clear. Six-figure plus job. I could show up and do whatever I wanted to do. Fly all over the world, business class. And I do miss my business class. <laughs> Jesus. Economy after flying in business class is just a struggle. Anyway. <laughs> so, but when I'm buying my own tickets, I'm 100% in economy. Right. Um, you know, I had three months of savings at the time. So, but even when I'm going into the conversation, I was like, he ain't about to tell me no. He told me to apply for the job. Like he's telling me I can't work, wait to work for you, gaslighting. So he starts, you know, hemming and hawing. I don't know, da, da, da. And he was like, so what's then? I was like, well, you know, thank you for telling me, but I'm done. I'll be leaving in September. What are you going to do? Oh, no. I was like, oh, I don't know, actually. No idea. I don't have a plan, but you know what? I'm 40. I don't have kids. What's the worst that can happen, you know? But I, I know I'm leaving. Um, and then there was a series of events. And long story short, then, in, so that was in February, actually, of 2016. I did not understand the significance of telling you're leaving in September because I just figured, like, okay, I'm going to give myself six months. I'll figure it out. And at that point, I was just like, I have paid enough consultants invoices where they sent me, like, bullets, bullet points of reflections and I'm supposed to now pay you. So I was like, I know I can pay, I can figure out how to pay my rent. 
just right. based on the quality of consultants. So let me go and figure it out. And then um, the end of August, my mother calls me, tells me to come. She needs to talk to me. She's like, yo. Um, I mean, she didn't say it like that, but basically <laughs> she had been diagnosed with um, end stage pancreatic cancer. Oh, no. And so I and so I was just like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's the whole why well, I was supposed to leave in September. I don't know. So then I ended up leaving at the end of October because you know I needed a little time to figure it out. And there were some internal things that we had to figure out within OSF. And I transitioned into my own um firm and uh Herald Advisors. I um October 30th. No, October 6th. No. Anyway, October 30th is was my last day. But I, um, I think I incorporated myself as an LL, incorporated um, Herald Advisors at um, September, at the end of September, and then left a month later. And then because of my network, I, if you go to heraldadvisors.com, what you see is my fabulous logo. It's not filled out. I have not solicited, and this is why I say God's grace. I have not solicited for one client. Mm. Well, you, you, your experience, I mean, it's breathtaking just, just listening to you talk about, I mean, the Burma story alone, I mean, you're on like international spy level already there. I know. Uh, and <laughs> it's it's crazy. <laughs> and the fact that you work with all these organizations is wild. Um, yeah. It's it's very, very, very exciting. Just, just talking about your story before you start your own company. So talk to me about uh, the last four years and congratulations, because I know it's not easy, like you said, doing this in, in a pandemic. Woo! But God's grace is sufficient, I can tell you that. And I am clear that, you know, there's a saying, at least in the church, God's grace will never, God will never leave you where his grace can't keep you or something like that. And so I'm, I'm grateful to, to, to have been kept and to be being kept. And so I realized that what my niche is, is that I can make, I help or enable people to feel more comfortable. And I like partnering with leaders who are facing either a big problem or a big challenge or a big opportunity that they need to figure out how to navigate around. Um, and so essentially all of my clients have been that it's like, oh, you know, I just pitched this big outside. One of my clients was um, the head of the UN Girls Education Initiative. Uh, and she was like, I pitched this huge idea for a global gender at the center initiative. And now I got, you know, so and so and so and so and so and so governments have pledged six million dollars. And now, yay! And now um, they have to now I have to operationalize it. And so what am I, I? I need help thinking through what this could be. And I was just like, perfect. So I like things like that. This, these are how the groups can work together. This is the governance structure. Here's some ideas. These are the problems you're going to have with these partners. This is let's figure out how to position yourself. Where's the funding going to come from? Who's crazy? How you work around them? Who's whatever? How do you work around them? How do you engage people at different levels? Um, and so, you know, whether it's working for a policy network on short term advisements or helping people to figure out how to navigate a problem like I don't I don't I'm not really good at fundraising. Like I'm not that's just not my thing. But like if you already have because also once people have money, and I think that's what um, philanthropy exposed me to. A lot of times people focus, I think if you're in an organization, like you know what money you need to execute your budget or to execute your goals or 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 with that. But a lot of times with initiatives, especially multi-stakeholder partnerships or where people are coming from different areas, the money can be sitting there and people don't move forward because you have so many different types of entities and interests coming around the table. And so I think there's a lot of people that want money in their pocket, but they yeah. don't necessarily know how to spend it or what to do with it. Yes. Right? And the how. So that's a lot of the, the navigation. And it's interesting when I think back to my time at um, SBI at, SBI at uh, Randolph and the thing we kept talking about and referring back to in terms of exposure. Um, one of the things when I think about my high school period. I mean, I was never the cute girl. I was never, I'm six foot one. Now I stopped growing in the, I'm six one. I think I stopped growing in the seventh grade. So I was in ninth grade, six, 
for one. So I always like I was always odd. I stood out. I was always I was cool with everybody, but nobody's best friend, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I always was the person who like stood in you're the a, middle you're of in, you're intimidating groups. all the boys like me that were short. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then that comes out in different ways, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And so I had to figure out like so I was always this independent type of person, which is why, like, you know, when I wanted, when I figured like, oh, Kenya Swahili, like there was no, I have a lot of friends who, if they have an idea or they want to do something, they got to deliberate it with their friends. Like I, I never had that issue because I was always like the strange odd girl anyway. So I was just going to do something random, you know? And so I think that helped me. And when I look at my professional career, people rely on me to, to help them understand how to engage different types of people. So now, for example, in a lot of my work with multi-stakeholder partnerships, how do you engage UN agencies versus philanthropies versus philanthropies with a living donor versus an NGO versus a, an African government versus a, a, a government in West Africa versus a government in, in East Africa versus you know, um, a civil society network that has too much money or that doesn't have any money. And and what are the, the, the politics, you know, internal that the internal politics and how can we have every how can you get all of these disparate entities and in, with their interests and craziness and systemic racism? Um, <laughs> get them around the table to help move whatever the issue is forward. So for me, and like a lot of people in education, you know, some people are like, you know, I'm a teacher training specialist, so, or in early childhood or gender or inclusive. Man. I'm just like, what is the goal? As long as it's the goal, because, you know, we all agree education is important. Cool. Is a project on early childhood? Is a project on secondary? I'm not interested in conversations about Secondary is more important than, than early childhood. I'm very agnostic on that stuff. What is the goal? If, if the social change goal is, that's what I'm motivated by. And how do we help that um, move forward? I love that because education is my life's mission. And just understanding that, you know, whether you're talking about educating the kids, educating the parents, you know, you often run yeah. into those conversations. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, as long as we're pushing, pushing forward and making progress, you know, we can sit here and argue all day, but you know, it's somebody's got to do the work and somebody's got to get it done. And I right. uh, appreciate somebody like you on the front lines of pushing some of those uh, conversations forward because Thank they you. need not to be conversations. They need to be action. The bills action. need to be paid. Teachers need to be put in place and let's go. Let's go. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about what the future holds for Dr. Alicia Taylor. What, what is, you know, I, I thought it was very interesting when, you know, you were saying you're having that conversation with your coach that you, you know, you had landed your dream job. Obviously, uh, I think you're enjoying being a consultant. What is the thing that you want to do? What is the legacy that you want to leave behind? And who are some people that you want to connect with in order to do that? I am the next phase for me for Herald Advisors is to I'm in the process of establishing myself as a U.S. government contractor because my goal and my mission is to hmm, goal mission. My or mandate or requirement, I don't know what the word is. But, you know, you get to a point where it's like it's not just about me. Like, what am I supposed to do? Right. Like, again, that whole point about I want to be in the center of God's will for my life. Right. And I want to open doors for other people that look like me, that come from context um, that I come from. Um, and so I want more black and brown people in international development because, number one, it's a racket and an industry. And. If you think systemic or structural racism is prevalent in the U.S. education system, you ain't seen nothing until you have a 20 year old, um, you know, white American. Well, not 20, let's say 27 year old white American girl from woman from um, or man from uh, Kansas. No disrespect to anybody like sitting up advising with a master's degree or like two trips talking about they're an expert and dictating education policies right. to people with, with doctorates and ministers of education and, and operating in ways that 
they could never, even in their own school district, but you can go to a developing country and be presented as an expert. Um, and so I, I, I want to, I want to continue on like what you want to do and dream, but I, I'd love to have, uh, maybe it's a conversation for another day, but you know, what people can do to sort of, aside from <laughs> becoming a, you know, specialist in international development yourself uh, and going and what can people do to sort of educate themselves more about that environment to make sure that um, they're not getting into that. But because I think that's something that it affects us, right? It affects us in these international conversations. It becomes this, again, it gets into that circle where we're going around because yeah. 10 years from now, a policy that got debated, got kicked out of schools in, in America or in some given progressive state is suddenly kicked back around in in some other international Let me state. Give you an example. For example, 10 years ago, um, I mean, obviously you have charter schools in the U.S., but the charter school movement was very, you know, obviously very big 10, 15 years ago. And in contexts where um, charter school chains um, in the U.S., were not, you know, where there was some pushback or maybe they didn't make as much money or it wasn't as uh, fruitful or whatever as they thought it was going to be. These same investors are now all over Africa setting up charter schools, but they call them um, low fee private schools, like that type of connection and understanding like how essentially international, international development is an industry. And it's an industry where, I mean, from a, 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 a from different perspectives, on the one hand, I realize it's an industry where people make a lot of money, right? Like a lot, and I'm trying to make money because you know, because why not? First of all, um, and so I'm able to. So I see my responsibility as accessing and opening doors, and then con just contracting more black and brown people. Very. Yeah, I, I, I love that conversation around money because I'm a business guy all day, and yeah. I think that understanding of you know that we can do good work. Nonprofit work, philanthropy, whatever the case may be, but people can get paid. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, it's been a large part of the conversation with SBI. You know, Charles Thompson been volunteering for SBI for the last thirty years, and you know, trying to make it a sustainable nonprofit. You can't have an executive director that isn't getting paid, that isn't being paid, and having that's unbelievable the community, you know, come back, understand that and remember that, you know, in putting these programs together in creating sustainable programs, you need to pay people and not only pay people like a subsistence wage, but a actual wage where they can go out, take care of their family, take care of themselves, yeah. give back to that same community through their purchasing power, that sort of thing. It's an amazing piece of the community. Uh, I love the conversation around uh, women in the international community and the talking about, you know, you put money in women's hands, the whole society, the whole community raises up because we yes. spend that money. Who takes care of the family? Uh, yeah. I love those yeah, types of conversations. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so let's, let's go back to the dream here. What, what are we, uh, I know that you're talking about uh, getting more doors open for folks that look like yourself, uh, specifically in the international development community, because there's opportunity there. Obviously, um, there's a lot of bad actors in that environment. So the, the potential for both folks just to just to take advantage of that environment, also do some positive work in that environment is open. Uh, what else are we talking about? Um, I think that's my short term goal. I mean, medium, <laughs> something like five in the next five to 10 years. Right. Like, so I need to get um, my firm in the pipeline of subcontractors with you um the with you at the US Agency for International Development and then start managing um multi-million dollar projects which is by 2022 I will be that's awesome and who are some people that you want to connect with right now hmm she had to think I got I, I stuffed out no forward. specific <laughs> names come to mind but you know, and actually I'm more interested, I, I want to connect with um, entrepreneurs who have made the jump from 
six figures to multi millions, actually, to be clear, because it's a it's a different type of investment. So, for example, even just shifting, I realized I got to move from my accountant that I pay ninety nine dollars to do my taxes to the accountant that charges multiple times of that because he has access to different types of things. So it's a, it's like a, a strategic shift or a jump. It's like a chasm that has to be jumped. And so that's what I'm sort of lining myself um, up for now. And so people who have made that, that jump. Yeah. I'm, I'm a strong component. You put that out in the world that, that it'll come to you. So I'm sure Thank uh, you. it might not be somebody today or tomorrow, but nope, I believe it. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that person that, that knows somebody because you've done good work, you've proven yourself, Dr. Alicia Taylor, uh, you you have the credentials behind you. I'm so excited you. Uh, that you said yes to talking to me today. I'm so glad this that you're you, Thank uh, you. To the alumni. Um, I'm hoping alumni get in touch with you that are interested in international. Absolutely. All Please, right, um, anytime. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let you have the last word here. I'm gonna throw up the uh, Herald Advisor because I know your uh, email is on there. For, so for anybody that's interested, uh, they can get in touch with you. Um, but I'll let you uh, have the last word here and just say goodbye to folks and uh, let folks know how they can get in touch with you, Alicia. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much um, for inviting me for this conversation. I have really enjoyed it, um, and thank you. Thank you. As always, to um, Charles Thompson and SBI for your uh, continued um, support and encouragement, and and for the example truly that you have uh, that you have set. Um, my email address is Alicia A L E E S H A at heraldadvisors.com, and um, maybe you could put it back up on the screen. There you go. You can anybody can feel free to to, to email me with any questions, or you want to have a quick chat. If I don't respond, just send me another email. Don't feel <laughs> um, it's not. Don't take it personal. I'm a little bit all over the place sometimes. Um, yeah, and and just you and know, I, and I also time. just to FYI, I included. Uh, down below in the uh, notes of the YouTube video over to the right or left of the, the Facebook screen. Uh, your LinkedIn is over there so folks can connect oh, okay. with you on LinkedIn as well. Cool, cool. And, I, and I, I think, you know, the main thing is just to be encouraged and to stay encouraged and to take advantage of the luxury of exploration because it is a luxury and i think coming from where we come from it's like you know you go to school you graduate you get a job and you you know you don't really have a chance to look up and say you know what am i interested in so the my my biggest um i think gift was the space that my parents created for me and sbi created for me and campus created for me to say you can do and be whatever it is you want to be and i think that comes as a cliche and for me it was like, I can do and be whatever I want to do. I don't know what it is. And actually, and just knowing that I don't know is an answer. And keep saying that. And when you do whatever it is that you do know, however random or small, like me saying, I don't want to work year round. I don't want to be a teacher, but I like education. Like people looked at me like I was straight crazy. But because I was used to kind of being the odd girl, it was like, well, you know, I'm just still an odd random girl. And that has followed me throughout my career and actually has been a strength because then you step back and you see all the elements and then it falls into place. And, you know, I don't know about, you know, I'm not, I, this isn't like a religious thing. I don't know how people live their lives. But for me, like when you said, um, Cameron, like, you know, I put it out there, it will come to me. I truly believe that what God has for me is for me, period. So whoever I need to come into my orbit, whoever's orbit I need to be in is going is going to happen. And you got to hold you have to hold on to that, especially in these days and times and hold on to your peace. And do not let these crate do not let these people it's about to curse make you think you're crazy because you are not. That's it. <laughs> I'm done. I'm muted. Say goodbye to everybody, Alicia. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Hold on for me one second, Alicia. All right.
This is the Alumni Connections Project. We all know Randolph is better than the rest. Even when you progress, you still got a rep. A Philip Randolph Campus High School. But this is not a test. You should say it with your chest. Be proud of your origin. And if you are proud, support it then. Stronger together through unity. Better together. Let's build the community. Randolph isn't a school or a building. It's a legacy. It's not in your past. It's your identity. So show some pride. Alumni Connections is sponsored and brought to you by SBI, CCPI. SoundFoundBusiness.org SoundFoundBusiness.org The journey doesn't end with graduation and prom The journey doesn't end with graduation and prom The journey doesn't end with the journey doesn't end This is the Alumni Connections Project This is the Alumni Connections Project 8 Philip Randolph Randolph 8, eight Philip Randolph 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 Randolph, Randolph. 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 Randolph.